So I've been thinking a lot about winning and losing lately. Not just because of the Giants. Go Giants. Not just because of the presidential debates. Go Obama, really. But more for our movements. What does winning and losing really mean for the work that we're all part of now? And, and part of this thinking started about a month ago. I was on a flight from Vancouver down to San Francisco. Um, and I was, it was evening time. I was tired. I got onto the plane. I'm getting down in my seat, ready to order my glass of wine and just tune out. And I realized that I had been seated, coincidentally, behind David Suzuki, who, I don't know how many of you know this man, but he was one, he's a physicist, he's Canadian. He's one of the earliest people there speaking about climate change, warning about climate change. I think he's been on this track almost as long as Bill McKibben, who we're here tonight with. And at, right out of college, I was an intern's intern at the David Suzuki Foundation. This is a number of years ago, cast your minds back. We were actually putting together the first letter of Nobel laureate scientists all signing on saying, climate change is real, human-induced climate change is real, and it's on us. It's gonna happen soon if we don't do something very quickly. So I leaned over and, Bill, and David Suzuki and I started speaking. He leaned back over his chair and he leaned into me and this man has, he has this halo of silvery hair and this incredibly piercing eyes. And I hadn't seen him for a long time and he leaned in and he said, Becky, you know, we've lost. And you can imagine that wasn't exactly what I expected to hear from this man who was my mentor. And at first I really wanted to argue with him. I, was, I wanted to say, no, we're fighting so hard. We haven't lost. Look around you. And then I felt something different. I felt a sense of relief. Because, you know, we have not stopped human-induced climate change before it started. That's true. We did lose that. You know, it was called by Al Gore an inconvenient truth. Now it's become an inconvenient reality. And sometimes, some days, I have to say, it leads me into a bit of an inconvenient panic. <laughs> you only have to ask a farmer in Iowa dealing with crop failures, or a single mother in you know, New Orleans struggling to rebuild her home, or any of the climate scientists who are warning all of us that the Greenland you know, the Greenland ice sheet is smaller than it's ever been before. To know that climate change is real, it is happening right now. Right now. So you can imagine I got off that flight back in San Francisco in the evening, feeling a little stirred up. And I came back into the office the next day. And my first meeting of the day was with our forest team. And I think it was meeting 475 about the Disney negotiations. So, you know, where climate change really touches down isn't just in the places where the impacts are felt of extreme weather events, but it also touches down in places like Indonesia, where the tropical rainforests are being cut down so quickly for paper products, for palm oil, that that country is one of the leading greenhouse gas emitters in the world because of tropical deforestation. That's where it touches down. And Disney, as you can imagine, is a very big user of paper. And we have been negotiating with them about a responsible paper policy for 18 months. I mean, really, 18 months of talking. So I went into the office that day ready to say, that's it, guys. No more talking. We are not the Rainforest Negotiation Network. We are the Rainforest Action Network. And I'd like to see a little action, please. Yeah. But I got in there and I sat down and Lafcadio Cortese, our Asia director, who is somewhere amongst us tonight, he said to me, Becky, you're never gonna believe what just happened. 
So with that cliffhanger, I'm going to take you back to May 2010, because that is the date the Rainforest Action Network fiber-tested children's books of all the major US publishers in this country. And what we found out was that 60% of all the children's books being sold by the major US publishers contained fiber from Indonesia's endangered forests, directly from there. So, like a good, polite, environmental organization, we wrote them all letters and said, hey guys, you have a problem. You have, essentially, orangutan and tiger extinction in your children's books, and that's really not the greatest thing. You might want to deal with that before I have to do something to your nice corporation. And right away, six of them came back and said, we want to talk, we want to do something about this, and they proceeded to start taking action to clean up their supply chain, which was great. Yeah. Six is good. We wanted all of them. And so we produced a report that we launched publicly that got press saying these are the publishers that still haven't dealt with this. And a few others came to us and said, we want to deal with this. Let us work with you on that. Great. But Disney was a holdout. Disney, you will be perhaps shocked to know, is the largest publisher of children's books and magazines in the world, which is sort of concerning for a multitude of reasons. But of concern to us at the time was the fact that that means a lot of paper. And knowing that a whole bunch of that was contributing to very rapid deforestation in Indonesia meant that we really wanted to deal with them. So when we gave them one more chance and they still didn't want to do something about it, in fact, they said, we have this covered, is what they actually said. We launched a campaign. Now, some of you might remember, this was in June 2011, we launched the campaign in typical RAND style by dropping a banner over the executive gates that said, Disney destroys rainforests, and locking two very cuddly Mickey and Minnie Mouse people <laughs> to the executive headquartered gates in handcuffs holding chainsaws. You know, as a RAN action goes, I, I gotta be honest, this wasn't terribly dramatic. But when you're Disney, and the entire local media market is saturated, and the police are doubled up in laughter outside their executive headquarter gates, because really, it was really quite funny see, looking, you, you, you really pay attention. And within one week, we had six Disney executives in our office right here in San Francisco saying, we wanna do something about this. And so we started talking. Now, what made this negotiation take so long is partly because Disney showed up and said, you know, we don't want to just do this for our children's books. If we're going to do this, we want to have this cover everything. All of our global business, all of our subsidiaries, ABC, ESPN, Marvel Comics, and more. All of our 3,700 licensees around the world. We want to do this right. So it took a long time to figure it out. It's a very complicated supply chain. And what Lafcadio told me that day when I walked into the office all riled up was that Becky, Disney's ready to go public with their rainforest commitment, with their paper commitment. And last Thursday, I don't know how many of you know this, Disney publicly announced what will probably be one of the most far-reaching, if not the most far-reaching responsible paper policy ever adopted by a major global company. The other thing that took 18 months was that our team, our forest team, fought not just to have Disney commit to eliminating the very worst fiber, the fiber that we knew was coming from endangered rainforests, but they also got Disney to commit to not sourcing any fiber from places that had specific value or high value for the climate. And not only that, they got Disney to agree to not source any paper from places where there was social conflict. And I'll tell you, this says a lot about RAN, I think. 
a lot about what we value, what we care about, and what we consider to be non-negotiable. Because it took a long time to talk that company into doing all of that, including getting them to reduce their consumption and maximize their recycle, and everything else that goes into a really excellent global policy. And we managed to make it all happen. And so before I go any further, I want to introduce you to our forest team, the people that were in these negotiations. This group of people who you'll be able to count them when they stand up. Stand up, why don't you actually, guys? All of you. Please. Robin, Bill, Lafcadio, Lindsay, supported by the wonderful communications team and everybody else that ran, and supported by all of you, these four people moved a $40 billion company and got that company to change everything about the way it sources and uses paper. It's a really big deal. Yeah, one more time. But you know, we don't really know what made Disney. What was the thing? Everyone wants to know what's the thing that moved Disney? What was that moment when that big company decided, okay, it's worth it? Was it the fiber testing, the data? Was it the action? Was it our really smart campaigners in a negotiation? Was it because the CEO just happens to really love Sumatran tigers? What was it? Is it because global corporations in 2012, partly because of all the work that we do together, just simply can't behave the way they did 20, 30 years ago. Could be any of those things. The bottom line is, we don't always know exactly what it is that creates change. We don't know exactly what it is. It takes everything from science all the way to faith. And it's the fertile place right in the middle of that. That spot where those things come together that's where really exceptional campaigning happens. And that's where Iran strives to be all the time. So to take you back to my flight, you know, the conversation with David Suzuki went on a lot longer than just that first moment. Went on after the stewardesses were, you know, flashing the lights and telling us very angrily to sit down. And he wasn't saying, it's game over. Far from it. His point, and I, I, really, I really agree with him about this, is that we need to remember that it's bigger than climate change. Stay with me, people. I can see people going, oh my god, really? Really? We've been really, we've been really trying to stop climate change. I'm not saying that climate change isn't the most urgent and pressing thing we have to be dealing with. What I'm saying is, that we need to be setting our sights higher and deeper at the same time. Because what we're really talking about, if we're honest with ourselves, is transforming everything about the way we live on this planet. Really. Yeah. We're talking about re-embedding the economy within the limits of nature. That's the project. And it's a really long-term one. It's transformational. Albert Einstein said that you can't solve a problem on the same level that it was created. You have to rise above to the next level. And I think that's a really beautiful quote for our times. You know, we really are in the midst of what will be the next industrial revolution. Joanna Macy calls it the great turning. And I say that it's the evidence that it's happening is all around us if we care to look. You know, we did not stop human-induced climate change before it started. We lost that. But people, look around you. We are not losing. This is the year that 124 coal plants have been shuttered. This is the year that Iowa produces 20% of its electricity from renewable energy. This is the, the year that four people talked a $40 billion company into stopping sourcing any paper from the rainforest or areas of social conflict. There are big 
things happening. And that is in no way meant to diminish the urgency of what we're trying to achieve. It is simply to say that we also need to pay attention to where we're winning. Martin Luther King said that the arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice. And sometimes I don't think we can see it bend. Sometimes it sort of feels like it's flattening out. And then there's other times, like last week, when we saw what Disney did, that we can see that arc perceptibly bending towards justice, towards balance. Thank you all for being part of that. <laughs>